Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. Uh, I'm Harsha Nikhar and this talk is about the art of letting go, secure delegation of permissions in AWS environments presented by Sara Piraz. And uh, before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. We would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, Blue Cat, Toyota. It's with their support along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are being streamed live. And as a courtesy to our speakers and audience, we ask that to you to check to make sure that your cell phones are set to silent mode. And if you guys have any question, please use the audience microphone so that YouTube can hear you as well. And uh, with that, let's get started and please welcome Sara. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for being here this evening. Um, as it was just mentioned, my name is Sara Perez and I'm a principal cloud security engineer at Okta. I'm originally from Barcelona, Spain, and I'm also a telecommunications engineer by trade, but somehow I ended up in InfoSec anyway. Um, I spent some time doing penetration testing and delivering training at conferences, but then I moved to the other side, and um, I've spent the last few years building security solutions in the cloud. About today, today I'm going to share with you the journey we followed to allow our engineering teams to use restricted IAM actions. Um, I'm going to dig into why this need came up, why all of a the sudden they needed to perform actions they hadn't used before. I'm also going to share with you how those actions were restricted and why, because that's going to give us a tool to understand how we solve these problems. I'm going to deep dive into the two use cases we had, and we'll do some quick recap, talk about future work, and then hopefully have time for questions if I don't run over time. So how did this all start? Um, for us, as for any company, we thought it was time for change. We wanted to refresh the way our customer environments were created. And we wanted to do that because uh, we, th we wanted to have a faster time to market, so be able to deliver those faster. And also, we wanted to improve our operations and reliability of the environment. And with new infrastructure comes, comes new requests. How does that look like? We moved from an architecture where everything was EC2 instances, everything was installed in those EC2 instances and was managed. And that took a very long time for us to set up. We moved from that to using EKS and AKS clusters. We also moved from being just a native US house to also provide these services in Azure, something that has had been requested from us for a very long time. And um, in this process, you can see here, we have a control plane that is in AWS, and we are able to create customer spaces, which are different uh, AWS accounts with the, the customers on them, and also Azure subscriptions with the same kind of infrastructure to provide our services on them. And these environments, because they take a while to, um, to create, they also suffer changes. So initially, we had used Kiem uh, to be able to grant access to our service accounts in Kubernetes to allow them to use IAM roles. But then we decided to we, it was time to move into the recommended way that um, AWS um, facilitated for us. It, so the project had been going on for quite a while. And in that process, new things came up. And we wanted to adhere to those best practices. And also, as the project evolves, we developed the need of not only having communication from the control plane into Azure, but also from services in those spaces back to our AWS accounts. And that's, that's how the, the initial requests came in. The first one was we need from each customer space in Azure, we have a service that is going to need to send data to an S3 bucket. There, were, there are different ways of establishing communication in between clouds. At the time, uh, using IAM users was found to be the fastest and best option. So that the request was essentially, we need to be able to create IAM users. They were not able to do this before. Following uh, what we saw of the architecture, we were using PM, and we wanted to move to the recommended way 
uh, by AWS, which is using an OIDC provider. When you create a cluster, an EKS cluster in AWS, it comes with an OpenID uh, URL, and you can use that URL to, connect, to create an OpenID Connect provider that then the roles are going to use for those service accounts. So again, the request was, we need to be able to create OpenID Connect providers, which is what was not allowed up until then. And this is how it came to be. All of a sudden, to us, to the Cloud Security Operations team, we get this request. We need to be able to create IAM users and also OIDC providers. How did we have these actions restricted and why? The quick answer is AWS organizations, SCPs, and policies. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit. For us, in AWS, we have, we organize our accounts using AWS organizations, which is a service from AWS that allows you to have one main account for management, and then organize your accounts in different buckets, which are called organizational units, which are these uh, top layer that we have here. You can name, it, name, name them whatever you want and organize them however you want. Um, we decided to create one new one for the new environments and then separate them um, also per environment, so development, production, and sandbox. And within those, we can have our AWS accounts. All of these is managed from a management account that has a different login to the rest of the accounts in the organization, which means the access to it is more restricted. Why is this useful? We, this allows us to apply uh, guardrails at different levels if we wanted to. So we could apply guardrails at the prod level and different ones at the dev level. Which guardrails? Service control policies. Service control policies um, allows us to specify the maximum level of permissions. For us, we follow the, the default way from AWS, which is using a denial list approach, which means that when you create a new account, that new account is going to have a policy that it's going to allow for any service in that account to be used. These do not grant permissions, they just allow services to be used. And then we have other SCPs on top of those that deny or restrict access to specific actions. And, and that's what we will see here later. The next layer we've got is the account layer, and those are identity policies and permissions boundaries, which we will also see during, during this talk. Those ones are attached to roles, or um, IAM users, and there are many different types. The ones we'll see today, we'll see inline policies. Those ones are attached directly to roles or users, and they are one-time policies. As soon as that user or role disappears, that, a policy, that policy goes away. On the other hand, we have the managed policies, which can be AWS managed. Um, most of you or some of you may be familiar with the administrator access policy. Uh, that one's created and fully managed by AWS. You can't remove it, but you can use it across multiple uh, principles. And customer managed, those are the ones that you can create. You can reuse across different users and roles and yeah, update them anytime. For permissions boundaries, permissions boundaries are a specific use of a customer managed policy. You can create a customer managed policy and use it as a permission boundary. And we will see some examples of this later. Last but not least, the last layer of the cake is the resource policies. Those ones are attached to resources such as S3 buckets or KMS keys. These ones, we, we will not see them in detail today just because they did not factor into the solution that we came up with. So they do not uh, have any relevance for today. Right, and this, this is how, right, how we, how we had those permissions uh, restricted at different layers. We're going to see an example. When I was talking about uh, denial list strategy for our SCPs, this is what I meant. For the first ask about the IAM users, we had a policy, a statement within one of our SCPs that denied the use of these actions on any resource, as you can see down here, for any role except for the ones specified here. So it's basically an allow list 
of which roles are allowed to perform actions such as create user, remove user, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, similarly, for the creation of SAML and OADC providers, we had exactly the same. So we had a deny action, a deny um, effect for the following actions, for any resource and any role except for the ones specified here. So again, we had uh, a restriction at the top level, as you saw, top level of the chain, that said these actions can only be performed by a set of roles. Right, and why did we have these ones restricted? These ones were restricted to very specific roles, in between them uh, the cloud security operations team, such as us, and some automations that needed to perform those actions. No one else. Why? Well, for, for IAM users, for those that you are familiar with, if you are familiar with them, they have long-term credentials. They become very costly to, to maintain. You have to have uh, processes to rotate them in, in the case that uh, they are compromised, they ended up on a Slack channel, on a kid repo, repo by, uh, by just very bad luck. Uh, so you have to have mechanisms to rotate them, but also if someone leaves that had access to them, you also are obligated to rotate those. And last but not least, they were not really conceived to be used by workloads. AWS recommends you use them as the last resort if you don't have any other options. For SAML providers, we use, um, or OIDC providers, we use OIDC in our accounts, and we wanted to make sure that only approved OIDC providers can be created in those accounts. Otherwise, anyone could just create one and um, grant access to whoever they wanted to, to, to those accounts or the account that the provider was created on. Right, and now that we we had a clear idea on what systems we had in place to restrict these actions and a clear idea of the needs, we needed to build our solution. And for us, it was very important to uh, fulfill the following requirements. The first one was flexibility. We needed to be flexible. Cloud security operations team is not very big and engineering needs to move very fast. So for that, we wanted to come up with a solution that will make them as independent as us as possible, and that it wouldn't require any money or processes or approvals. Uh, we also wanted it to be secure, of course. We didn't want to have, we wanted to provide flexibility without sacrificing insecurity. So it was important for us to have guardrails that will fulfill our needs and also give us visibility on what's going on and what's happening. And last but not least, it, has, it had to be scalable. Um, we were doing all these efforts to uh, improve our time to market, operations and real, uh, reliability. These solutions had to be able to grow with it. And with that, I'm going to um, share with you how the solutions for the, fir the solution for the first use case came in, which is, was the, that request of we need to create I am users for every single Azure space. How did we solve this? In short, SCPs, identity policies, and permissions boundaries. So we had a scenario that looked like this. We have a control plane down here, um, which was uh, that account that we had creating spaces in both sides. We have the Azure customer spaces on this side that we're going to use those users to then send data into one of our um, storage AWS accounts to be processed. Our first question was, who needs to be able to create these IAM users? And the response from engineering was a control plane role. Um, this role is, a, is used by automation, and it needs to, on the creation of a new space, it needs to be able to create this user to then use those credentials. The good thing about this role was Downside, it was created and managed by engineering, so it wasn't under our control. We have specific guardrails for roles we create. But on the, on the bright side, it, it had a very good inland policy. It was very tidy, which made the whole process um, easier for us. When I mean tidy, I mean it didn't have star-star to everything. Um, 
So it had only those actions that it needed for those resources that it really needed. So how did, the, did this look? Right, we will have the control plane role with an inland policy that will need to create a user. That user for service X would have its own inland policy to be able to do put object into S3. So how do we, ima let's imagine we allow control plane role to our SCP allow list. We add it there, so it's able to perform these actions, but we want to be able to control how those users are created. We don't want this role to be able to create users with any kind of permission. That would be a terrible thing to do. So what did we decide to do here? We created a permissions boundary. We created a permissions boundary that would, uh, on top of the inland policy, add restrictions on how those users could be created. And we will see, we will see this uh, in practice in a bit. That permissions boundary would force the control plane role to create users with another boundary attached. If the user was created with the correct boundary attached, um, everything would be successful. The user would be created. It would have its inland policy and the permissions boundary. If it wasn't, it would just simply fail. The creation would not be successful. At all of this, we would use SCPs to also protect the resources involved in this. So we would protect uh, the permissions boundary for the control plane role because we don't want anybody tampering with that boundary and giving it more permissions or, or causing any trouble with it. The same for the user boundary that's also protected at the SCP level. And we're, when I mean protected, I mean it's added to, an, uh, to a list of resources that should not be tampered with um, except for specific roles, same as we saw before. We're going to try and see this. I hope it's clear. We are, I'm doing this in an account just on the UI to make it uh, more clear for everyone. I'm logged in as the control plane role, and I'm going to create an IAM user for service X. And I'm going to do so without attaching any boundaries, just because I don't want to commit to the exercise. And that's going to give me an error. It's not going to allow me to create it, telling me that the permissions boundary does not allow it. So I go back, I go back and I'm going to try to attach a permissions boundary this time, but again, for service Y instead of service X. But that's also not going to work because the permissions boundary is not going to allow it. So finally, I decide to comply with it, go back and attach the one for the service X. And that allows me to create the user. But what happens now? What if I want to tamper with it now? Just go and I want to change the boundary, for example, because I really want to apply the boundary for service Y. So I just go and try to perform this action. And again, it won't let me. The permissions boundary would say, you are not allowed to do this. What happens if I just try and remove it instead of tampering with it? we're going to find the same problem. It's not possible. So once the user is created, with a, it's only created with a correct boundary attached, and it can be tampered with after the fact. So we, we, we got uh, the solution that we wanted. We wanted to make sure that those users were created with those guard rules that we would be confident with. To show you how this control plane rule looked like, and how does that inland policy work and how the permissions boundary work. So we see here that it says customer inline. These are the ones that can only be used once. They are attached directly to the role and to the IAM user themselves. And then we see we have the permissions boundary. We create that boundary, sorry. We create that boundary and we control it. Here we ask platform uh, engineering to add the IAM actions to any resource and then the permissions they already had for EC2 instances and secrets manager and whatnot. And we made sure they added the ones for management of users without specifying resource. Why? Because we are controlling that at the permissions boundary level. 
We don't care the permissions they have on those services. We grant star. We allow the inland policy to deal with that. And what we do here is list and get. We allow them to do anything. But for the creation and management of users, we uh, establish a restriction based on naming convention. So for service X, you're able to create it as long as it has these boundary attached to it. And that's why when you were trying to use a different boundary, that was not being successful. If we had a different service, we could use exactly the same to, to perform the same restriction. And then we also added some restrictions um, to avoid the tampering with um, the permissions boundaries. To, and, and this was m almost the most complicated case of evaluation. I just wanted to quickly also show you what happens on the user side, on the user side. So we're going to have a user that is going to have the inland policy. You can see here on your left. Um, and then it's going to also have the permissions boundary. And they look extremely similar. This is because when you evaluate, there's an evaluation in between the inland policy and the permissions boundary to determine which permissions are allowed. Those permissions have to match in between one policy and the other one. If anything, the identity policy could be more uh, open, so it could have S3 star, but because my permissions boundary on, only has those actions specified, only the user would only be able to perform the actions in the boundary. So the boundary sets the top level. This is the maximum you can do, even if you have a star here. So for us, we did it very, very tidy. We allowed the identity policy to set the, the parameter customer on the S3 bucket path. You can see that in the boundary that's set as a star, because we have no way of knowing the different names of all the customers, and it would make it impossible to build a boundary otherwise. If someone tries to create a user with a different inland policy, as I said, EC2 star, in terms of when the user goes and tries to access EC2 star, that evaluation will fail because EC2 permissions are not in the permissions boundary. If even just in the permissions boundary there was EC2 describe, that will be allowed, but there's nothing, so the evaluation fails. So gotten to this point for the creation of IAM users, we were successful in allowing engineering to create those IAM users with a specific guard road and without needing us for absolutely anything, which was the original goal. For the creation of OIDC providers, though, things are slightly different. We were able to solve them also using SCPs and identity policies, but policies can get you so far. So we had to add an architecture of events in Lambda to cover those gaps that the policies were not covering. Again, what does this look like? So we would have our EKS or EKS cluster with different service accounts, and we want them to be able to use different IAM roles to access different IAM, uh, to access different services. For that, we create an OEDC provider, again, who needs to create it? In this case, the infra deployer role. Differences from the previous use case is that this role was created by us, by cloud security, not so good is that it was way more permissive than the, the control plane role. So we had to play the game a bit differently. Again, we would have a role with an inline policy that needs to create an OIDC provider. In this case, because we managed that role, we could, it was already protected from tampering at the SCP level. We decided to uh, come up with a statement to add to its inline policy, so it had lots of permissions, and we were able to add a statement like this. So instead of adding a boundary or doing anything extra, we just updated its own inland policy. And it looked like so. So we have an effect deny, and if you look here, my pointer is not working, but we have the not resource instead of resource. Not resource allows us to tell it, along with the deny, 
that these actions are denied for the creation of any OIDC provider except for the one that is specified here. So as long as the provider you're creating matches this naming convention, you'll be allowed to do it. If it doesn't, you won't be. And this, this was very useful for us because we didn't um, have to try and specify all those providers that the role was not able, should not be able to create. That would have been a, an impossible list, but only to specify those ones that could. Now, I've gotten to this point, uh, we get to the point where policies don't cover everything. And one of the things that it didn't cover is that for an EKS cluster, you can create that OEDC provider on any AWS account you wanted. So effectively, if you have one cluster in one account, you could create the OEDC provider for the other account, uh, for that cluster in a different account. And that's something that we agreed with engineering that should not happen, that if there was ever a use case for that cross-account access, it would happen with role chaining and not creating many, many, many OIDC providers in different accounts. And that's something we could not cover with policies. And that's where we created the architecture of Evans and Lambda. Um, this solution, we also decided to use it for other providers, not just EKS. So the, the whole solution contemplates other validations, not just this one. So for this, what's going to happen, I'm going to create the OIDC provider and that's going to trigger an event breach rule. We created an event breach rule in every single account. On triggering, that was going, the event is sent to a centralized bus in a centralized account, which in turn will trigger a lambda. So we're going to zoom in onto that right-hand side. Right, our lambda receives the event, and it's going to perform a set of checks. Uh, some of these checks are related to the EKS providers. Some of them are uh, related to other OIDC providers that we decided to cover with this solution too. So it's going to check the type of provider, if the principle, the role that it's creating it, is correct or not, thumbprint, audience, and that if it's created on the correct account or not. If those of any of the evaluations fails, we're going to go ahead and remove the provider and notify the team so we can review the activity. If all of them are successful, everyone's happy and everything's uh, working as it should. But we, we would have logs that that happened to confirm that everything's working. And again, as soon as before, we use SCPs to avoid tampering of the infra deployer role and the different event rules. Otherwise, someone could go into an account, just disable the event breach rule, and just render the whole solution unusable. But with this, we are able to, to protect it. Also, the auto remediation role used by the Lambda, that's also protected at the SCP level. And now we're going to see, hopefully, that's clear. We are in an account. We're logged in. We have a cluster in a different account. And this is the OIDC provider URL that it has. And I'm in a different account as the infra deployer role. And I'm going to try and create an OIDC provider for the cluster that is in a different account. This is one of the use cases that we don't want it to happen. So we just go through the process. And this is legitimate, so there's nothing that is going to actually prevent it from happening. It's created because it's an EKS cluster. And now we're going to have a look at the logs of that lambda. We see that it receives the create open AT Connect provider event. Um, this is one of those events from CloudTrail. And we can see that it was created by the infra deployer role and that everything theoretically looks good because it's an EKS or ADC provider. But then we see that one of the validations failed because it was able to identify that the provider and the cluster are in different accounts and that's not allowed. So later on, we can see that there was a delete event that's our Lambda going to perform the remediation. And that sends an alert to Slack 
for us to see it and go and see what happened and review it with the team or uh, trigger an incident if necessary. Now we refresh to check that it was actually removed and it was, it did what it was supposed to do. Right, so gotten to this point, we had also been able to facilitate the creation of those IDC providers without us having to approve anything. We were able to, so we committed to the first point. We wanted it to be flexible. It become, became flexible for everyone. Uh, for both engineering, they were able to move as fast as they wanted to, and we didn't receive a bunch of tickets every, every day. Security, uh, we set up all the guardrails that we needed and we were, um, that would allow us to feel comfortable with the solution. And also we gain visibility because we have this framework now reviewing every single creation of providers. In terms of scalability though, not so good. Why? Because you have a hard limit on the number of IM users you can, you can create per AWS account. I think the limit right now is at 5,000. It seems like an unreachable limit but we, when we started all of this, we had one service from Azure that needed to speak to AWS. By the end of it, we had three. So if you start counting three IAM users per customer in Azure, that can grow very quickly. So for future work, and this is actually happening, we decided to replace the creation of IAM users that you saw by IAM roles anywhere. That's a service that came out mid last year, if I recall correctly, and allows external workloads to use IAM roles um, as, if, as if they were just in, in AWS. And we are replacing all those IAM users with IAM roles, which will prevent us from having long-term credentials and will make us, um, this more scalable. And I have added a bunch of references here. This is basically AWS uh, it will use as dogs, but these are the most useful ones I ever found. Sorry, that was so quick. And that's pretty much all for me. Uh, this is my first ever talk at a conference, so thanks for being here at this time. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, happy to take them. No questions? Sure. I'm curious on how you, from since those are users, if there's any consideration for the keys that were created by it, like managing them or protecting them in any For the access keys and secret keys, we did have, so we did have a rotation in place. Um, there was a mechanism that was rotating those keys every X amount of time that was created. Well, it was a demand from us to platform teams and um, we wanted to add further uh, protections at the policy level. We wanted to restrict uh, the source IP for those credentials, but because we started the, replacing that with roles anywhere, we didn't get to, to implement that. But that was the next step for us, restrict the source IP, which is something um, quite attainable to do. No more questions? No? Oh, well, thanks everyone. Cheers.